Okay, in this video, um, we're going to look at uh, how to outline the Trinity in Scripture. Um, now, this is something I teach in a locally in a group I have. Um, we don't meet in a church per se. It's a coffee house composed of businesses that are Christian. Um, but I don't have a lot of uh, Christians that come and want to learn um, the, these things to more deeply understand their faith. Uh, a lot of people are turned off in some way by the word apologetics, not understanding that the foundation of apologetics is understanding what you believe, because apologetics um, runs uh, in numerous fields. It's just simply a defense uh, of uh, a belief system or practices. Um, so in this uh, video what we will do is we'll show how to outline the Trinity in Scripture and how to present it, how to learn it, understand it, present it. Um, a lot of uh, anti-Trinitarians believe that Trinitarians are just slaves to uh, creeds, specifically the two Nicene creeds, uh, the first and second. But we can prove easily that this is not the case in the writings of the pre-Nicene uh, church fathers. The church fathers in pre-Nicene period, periods, uh, in their writings, we find the nature of God clearly revealed in there. And the Trinity is a tenet of historical Christianity. And some of the historical tenets derive, <coughs> come from the uh, Trinity itself. So... Just to begin here, um, usually a um, Bible will have a blank uh, page in it somewhere in the front or maybe even in the back. <clears throat> These are inexpensive Bibles that I have here. My favorite translation is the NIV and uh, these are free from the Bereans, by the way. And so the way we start off is just here at the top we write we write this in, in at the top, uh, the nature of God revealed scripturally. I'll go ahead and read it. The third word of Genesis 1-1 in the Hebrew canon is Elohim, a Hebrew plural. We know that the Hebrews are the first monotheists in history, yet their concept of deity contains plur plurality. Throughout the Old Testament occurs the royal us, where God speaks in the first person plural numerous times. And then under that, I just went ahead and wrote in on, on mine, um, <clears throat> Tenet of historical Christianity, the Trinity. The Christian Godhead is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and then here, like for instance here, you can see the royal us. I just wrote the word the royal us, and then I put an underline. Uh, I underlined it, and then I wrote the scriptures under it where the royal us occurs uh, in the Old Testament. And then I collared these, or highlighted them, in purple. Now I use some some wax like or some kind of crayon things from Walmart that are similar to a type of highlighter that is a wax kind that doesn't bleed through the pages and um, works very well uh, so just to give an example of how this works um, like for instance Genesis 126 and 27 here we have Genesis 126 and 127 in purple. So what we've done is written these scriptures out where it occurs, colored them in purple, and then colored these very scriptures where they occur in the Bible in purple as well. So it makes it very easy um, to know where these scriptures are for presenting the Trinity, for defending it, for learning it, for understanding it. Um, uh, and then like in green, uh, I I did uh, the Father is God or the deity of the Father in green. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. These scriptures here are Genesis 126 and 27, Genesis 322, Genesis 117, and Isaiah 6 8. Those are the occurrences of the royal us in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, uh, for the deity of the Father, um, Matthew 3 16 and 17. Matthew 17, 5, Mark 1, 11, and 1 Peter 1, 3, as well as 2 Peter 1, 17. Now, 
there's a lot more scriptures you can put under this if you want to, but it becomes uh, pretty repetitive if you do that. Um, you can pull out of each of the Gospels. I've got Matthew and Mark here. There's also Luke and John. Uh, they almost, they basically say the same things, but if you're wanting to prove that the deity of the Father in all three, uh, all four, I apologize, all four um, Gospels, uh, you can do that. It just, it kind of becomes very repetitive, repeating um, the same thing. Uh, oh, and here, just to show, uh, I'll give you another example of the the outlining for the Trinity. Uh, here, for instance, is um, uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. So we find that over, when we come over here, Matthew 17, 5. Uh, now, the, there's kind of an issue with this in that the Trinity, though at least locally in my home city, in the churches locally, a lot of Christians um, proclaim to be Trinitarians. But sadly, they don't really um, understand or know how it's presented um, scripturally, uh, how to how to defend it scripturally, um, how to find it scripturally, how to reveal it. Um, in fact, it's challenged a lot by other gospels locally as well, because uh, I think it's well understood by these other gospels that most Trinitarians or professing Trinitarians don't don't actually know how to or understand the Trinity or how to defend or present it. Um, uh, just moving on a little bit right here, our scriptures, the Son is God, the deity of the Son. Um, the scriptures are uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14, 1, John 8.57 and 58, John 10.32 and 33, John 20.28, Acts 20:28, 20, Philippians 2:5 through 8, Hebrews 1:6, Hebrews 1:8, Revelation 1:8, Revelation 2:8, and Revelation 22:12 through 16. Um, and then right here we have um, the Holy Spirit is God or the deity of the Holy Spirit. Acts 5, 3, and 4. Acts 28. 25 and 26, 2 Corinthians 3:17, and Isaiah 6, 8, and 9. Now, when you use Acts 28, 25, and 26, you want to use them with Isaiah 6, 8, and 9. That's what I call a scripture set. And I do this in, in other areas, too, where you take a scripture from the New Testament, in this case where Paul is um, in an argument with the, with the apostles, he refers back to the prophet Isaiah, specifically in chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Paul, being one of the most educated men in his day, uh, Pharisee of the Pharisees, um, said it was the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was right when he spoke to your forefathers. And he basically repeats what Isaiah says here. But when you go back to Isaiah, Isaiah says that it was God who spoke to him. Now, Paul was not making a mistake. Very well educated. Paul is saying that it was the Holy Spirit that spoke. Isaiah was saying that it was God who spoke, which means that the Holy Spirit spoke and the Holy Spirit is God. So scripture sets are very good for <clears throat> proving um, deity of the persons of the Trinity, of the Godhead. <clears throat> now I also use, um, I also am dealing with some uh, Muslims. And with Muslims, to prove to them that Christians believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I begin with, Elohim, uh, the Hebrew plural, <clears throat> and then I go to the um, occurrences of the royal us. Since Muslims accept the authority of the entire canon of the Old Testament, it's a good place to start with them, to begin with them, just for them to begin to see the mystery of the plurality within the nature of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, sadly, locally and I'm suspicious that it goes far beyond just my local uh, city children and youth uh, are not being taught the Trinity or the personal work of Jesus Christ Christology which Christology is contained within this as well but it is also a specific um, 
subject of its own, deserving um, attention to it as well. Since Jesus Christ is the greatest revelation of God that we have, he's God in the flesh. Now, sadly, most um, children and youth are not being taught this, and they will not go on to learn it either. And I was suspicious that it was just a teaching being neglected in, in the local congregations. But what I have come to understand is that actually what's happening are the teachers in the churches don't know the Trinity themselves to teach it. They don't know Christology themselves to teach it. Now the reason this is so vitally important is because when I came to faith, I was not taught um, Christology. So I didn't know the personal work of Jesus Christ. Uh, so for the first year of my faith, I was stuck between three Gospels until it kind of a revelation from a very simple sermon came to me that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and that he is the measuring rod by which we determine which Gospel is true and which is false. So I kind of determined within myself that first year of my faith of darkness and confusion um, became a seed for a passion of understanding what I believe, knowing how to defend and share it. But also, um, within myself, I determined in, in my relationship with God that I would never leave anyone where I was in ignorance. And so what's happening now, um, kind of in American Christianity in general, is that there's this there's this uh, desire to get people saved, to believe in Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice for them, but not much beyond that. Not much is being done to allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify them, to work in them, to grow them beyond that. There's a lot of neglect um, beyond the message of the cross. Now, it is very, also, this uh, to me is a very big problem as well locally, and I'm uh, s s suspicious that it's beyond local uh, issue. Um, there are 12 scriptures that compose the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, 1 Corinthians 1.22 through 24, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. If you have only those 12 scriptures, you have the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the foundation of the faith of Christianity. Now, sadly, those 12 scriptures are not familiar scriptures locally in the congregations and likely beyond just local issue. Now, I teach those first, and I establish people in those first before I go on to the Trinity and Christology. Um, that's the first thing that you really want to give to them. But then you want to move on to Christology and then on to the Trinity. Um, if you don't do that and you leave people in ignorance, you're leaving them to the wolves. And uh, the other Gospels out there, they are well trained and understand very well what they believe. And uh, really the scales are tipped in their favor most oftentimes because not that anyone should feel obligated to do so, that hopefully it would be out of a desire and uh, gratitude for what Christ did on, uh, for us on the cross that we would want to grow in knowing him more and understanding his word to us even um, more deeply. Now, the other Gospels, they do this because they're trying to earn their salvation, sadly. Uh, but it does give them, uh, tragically, uh, tips the scales in their favor against us oftentimes because most Christians do not um, understand very well what it is they believe, know how to defend it, or know very well how to share it either. And so it puts them at a disadvantage. And locally there is a problem of Christians being converted out of uh, the congregations. And what I've gotten from senior ministers is kind of this attitude that, well, if people are saved, they're going to stay saved and they're going to be all right. But if we look at Galatians uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, we find that Paul is speaking to the Galatians who have been deceived by another gospel. Uh, there's danger in just leaving people ignorant. And the pastor isn't always going to be there with a lay person when their faith is challenged. So it begins with understanding what it is we believe. And really it begins with, uh, I mean, people come to salvation at different ages. I was 17. But when we're working with children, it's very important that we get them 
uh, beyond salvation to understanding the personal work of Jesus Christ. Now, I've done this with ages as young as five, just using John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14. And you can confirm that with Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 as well with them if you want to. Uh, but uh, this is the outline for um, the Trinity. And it only takes about three minutes to present it. I've done this out at the local Mormon church. They were very silent for well over a minute because they were refuting their idea of what the Trinity is and no one had actually presented the Trinity to them before. And in most cases, that is the problem. Most anti-Trinitarians are refuting what their idea of the Trinity is rather than what the Trinity actually is. And um, I listen to the critics of my faith. Bill Maher is a is one in the media quite a bit, and he's all the time um, misrepresenting what the Trinity actually is. So what he's actually refuting isn't even the Trinity. Now I am I like Bill Maher. I like his sense of humor. Um, I'm fans of a lot of the opposers of my faith, and I I honestly do believe that by listening to the challenges and arguments against our faith and and uh, defending against those that it is the number one way to deepen your understanding of your faith of the scriptures and your relationship with God um, with con full confidence in God and in his word uh, so this is the video on how to outline a Bible uh, for the Trinity and it's a good um, teaching it's a good tool for teaching um, the Trinity and if you wanted to you could have people you know memorize these passages of scripture and or, you know, just however you want to learn them. But having a Bible that's outlined is very good because then you can uh, be ready to defend or present the Trinity to somebody. And uh, I did this actually without the outline at the Mormon Church. I really don't know how I did it. Um, I guess I had been looking over these scriptures long enough and doing this long enough that I was able to call pretty much all of these scriptures to mind when I did it. And um, so then I decided, well, why don't we go? Why don't I go ahead and outline the Bible for this and then um, teach other people to do that and and that way we understand a tenet of our faith, a critical tenet of our faith.